It's mid-December here at the Epic Homestead, and I figured it's high time I take you on at least my version of a winter garden. Here in San Diego, it's actually been somewhat cold, at least by our standards. You can see the cabbage is already popping off, but believe it or not, a couple days ago, I woke up at 6 a.m. to the sound of hail hitting the garden, and I walked out to at least the closest thing I'm ever gonna get to a winter wonderland. There was hail all over the place. So the focus of the winter garden really is the brassica crops, the things that really want to grow in the cold. And here in our warmer zone, what we like to do is start these in probably late September, plant them in October. Hopefully we don't get an October heat wave and then grow them straight through the winter with no cover to be able to get results like this. This is about halfway through the life cycle here, and I think these cabbage are really going to look good. So under here, you would normally see a ton of aphids clustered up. I always struggle with aphids in my garden, but I think because of the time we're planting them, they're just not here right now. It's maybe a bit too cold. They've kind of cleared out. So we're doing well in the cabbage bed. Over here, it's winter green season. So I've got some arugula, which tends to have a hard time growing in my summers. And I threw some beets in. Root crops is a great time to throw in. Even under cover in a colder zone, you can really do a lot with them. But what I noticed over here was that my arugula was growing way faster than my beets were. So the beets down here, arugula you can see is really large right here. So we've been selectively harvesting out and making some delicious arugula salads to free it up because the light's coming in from this direction. So it's just a little kind of a wonky thing that I had to deal with. You can see the beets over here are a lot more sizable, mostly because they're not really competing with anything. So over here, I have my broccoli. I had a good crop last year. This year, I expect it to be even better because it, it looks amazing, but also I planted it earlier, giving it some time to grow. Then I think I may have gotten too good at these Asian greens because this is mustard. I know there's some interesting things you can do with it. I don't like it this much. So I might need some comments on how to best use this much mustard, but needless to say, it's doing really well. And then here's a cool example of a succession sowing that's really easy to do no matter what your skill level in the garden. So over here, it's just some sort of loose leaf lettuce that you can either chop a head off or you can do a cut and come again around harvest where you're just taking the bigger leaves. This spinach went in second, just grab those big leaves. And then this mixed greens went in third. So about a week offset on each of these means you have really consistent and varied harvests for your greens. Over here, a couple barren beds. Don't beat yourself up about it if this is what the garden looks like. Sometimes you gotta leave something a little barren while you reset and make a better decision. Strawberries were in this bed this season. They've been reset out. I think the hail kind of got to them. They couldn't hold it through the winter. And then this kale's doing really well. This is a prolific crop for us right now. This one has made it into many rounds of a kale, bean, and sausage soup, which is absolutely delicious. Instant Pot a great way to make use of these massive amount of kale. Now let's check out the orchard. Here in the orchard, you can actually see me as I walk behind my two stone fruit here. These are the peaches and the nectarines that did extremely well to the tune of having like 50, 60, 70, maybe even 100 peaches on this tree. But it's a deciduous tree, so it is dormant right now and it's throwing out some buds. Should be really prolific. But what's really killed it this year has been the citrus. I can't actually believe it. These are 18 month old trees. They were probably a year old when they were planted. And I mean, look at this, this is a bear's lime. There's almost too many limes on this tree. So if you want one, drop me a comment. I might have to send some limes in the mail. Absolutely prolific. But the one I'm most proud of guys is the yuzu. The yuzu, I did not really have high hopes for. I thought it was gonna die. It looked sickly. You can tell it's really not growing as quickly as the rest of the trees, but it's making yuzu. So yuzu, not really known for being a super juicy fruit, usually good for flavoring. I mean, some of you are probably cringing that I'm dropping the peel on the ground, but come on, I have, I have a ton of them. I can sacrifice a little bit here. So this one, I, I don't know if it's exactly where I need it to be because it's really kind of dry, very seedy, not a lot of juice. I know that's a function of yuzu, but I just don't know if it's supposed to be this dry. Nevertheless, the flavor, is actually really sweet and nice if you don't get a ton of seeds. But citrus has been doing really well. I have to say that this arch with Cecile Bruner climbing roses is probably my favorite aesthetic piece in the entire garden. First of all, it's tall enough to actually allow me to go under it, but when this comes to spring, it will look incredible. So I'm very excited about this, but more so, you know my love of dragon fruit, I'm way more excited about the dragon fruit because I picked up two new ones. This one's Haley's Comet right here. I need to figure out how or if I'm gonna plant that one out. But this one's very special, it's actually a chimera. So it's two genetic variants in one, 
a really unique dragon fruit. But overall, the trellises have held up. The only thing I'm waiting on, I've gotten fruit off every single dragon fruit this year, except this one. This is Ecuador Pelora, the fabled yellow dragon fruit, one of the sweetest varieties. Also tends to take about two or three times as long for the fruit to form and ripen. So while I've gotten fruit off the rest of these, I'm waiting for about seven or 10 of these Ecuador Pelora to actually fruit up. The only other thing I wanna call your attention to here in the front yard is the artichoke patch. If you remember, this is watered off of a gray water system. And the coolest thing is that this is the second, I think, year that the artichoke have come back. And what you'll notice is you'll see offshoots. So if you want to, you could separate this out and plant it and re-extend your artichoke patch. Or like me, you could just kind of let them come up. So this is December. Artichoke's gonna start probably forming in February through, through April or so. I should have a few dozen artichokes in this patch. The backyard, I have to confess, my friends, it's not looking as good as the front yard is. A lot more planning going on right here, but I like to show you everything that's going on, the good, the bad, and the ugly, including this kind of haggard banana. We had that hail come through. It absolutely ripped these leaves apart. Kind of sad. I've been struggling with bananas. It's not really the easiest thing for me to grow. So if you have suggestions, please let me know. But I've got three plants going on, so maybe this year I'll actually get some delicious, delicious bananas. This really is just the orchard, graveyard, all sorts of different plants hanging out around here. The thing I'm really excited about, though, is the fact that I've started to landscape around this pond. So I've got some zoysia grass that I transplanted in the ground there to give sort of a matted look to some of these more barren areas. And then over here, this was like the barricade that we had to create for the pond in order to build this waterfall up. Ed the Pond Professor over at Aquascapes did a fantastic job of that. But then it begs the question, okay, well, what's gonna actually be behind here? A friend of mine did a really cool succulent trellis or terrace. That's what I decided to do. So while these look kind of puny right now, they should in about a year, maybe a year and a half, really fill in this backspace and look absolutely gorgeous, kind of trailing all over the place. However, the thing I'm the most excited about is covering up this massive 5,000 gallon water cistern. I thought it kind of looks cool, maybe I'll just keep it, but I think the truth is I'd much rather put something productive here, and what better than San Diego's most prolific growing vining fruit, which is the Frederick Passion Fruit. I've got one in here, I've got another in there, threw some T-posts into the ground and wrapped some wire around. Guarantee you by maybe May of this coming year, you won't see any of this. This is one of the most prolific growing fruits in our area. I chose two just because I wanted to cover it faster. And I even have the opportunity to perhaps create some sort of scaffold over and let it come over, which would also cool this tank from really any type of heat issues. So I'm excited about that. You'll see that coming in pretty soon. Now, back here in the pond, it's still a little bit barren. I need a lot of help in this area. I confess, I am not the strongest landscape designer, so I might have to bring in a couple friends to help me out there. But over here, I've got something really cool to show you. We've just introduced a lot of cool new shapes of our birdies raised beds. Number one, this is the shapes range. So this is like a hexagonal bed. You can actually turn this into 10 different shapes. Over there, there's the trapezoid version of the same thing. So a lot of creativity in this one. This one I really like. I'm calling this one the plus. It is so cool because you can come at it from every single angle and you can create some sort of unique planting strategies. We also have an L-shaped bed that's at Jacques Garden right now. So the thing I'm sort of obsessed with is if you put a plus in the middle and then you put four L's around it, so you'd have it kind of like coming out like this over to here, you get almost a garden in a box. You could have probably about a 20 by 20 foot garden without having to build anything at all. So coming up soon on the store, I'm super excited about it. But for now, this is kind of the research and development phase. This is the first year that I've seen asparagus kind of express its growth throughout a season. And I'm pleasantly surprised. This I didn't think would take off this quickly. There's a three different ways you can grow asparagus. One is from crowns, one is from the seed, and then one is from literal asparagus start. So the crown plus the upstart. And that's the one that we chose, the very last option. I think it might actually be the best one. It's clearly the fastest to establish. And when you're talking about asparagus, a plant that takes at least two or three years and can produce for 20 years, I'd take a couple year head start. So I'm really pleased with this. Of course, it's winter. It's not looking super strong right now. A little bit of yellowing going on. Jacques over in his garden actually just chopped his to the ground, which is what you're supposed to do at this time of year. I'm waiting a little bit longer on mine. I've got some incredible herb beds. 
This is, believe it or not, one lemongrass plant that has multiplied like crazy. So I'm probably gonna have to chop this down, do a little bit of propagation, but it's so, so prolific. Here's where sort of the embarrassment, there's not a lot going on in the backyard right now, except for we've got Paul hanging out. So Paul, you've probably seen him before on the channel. You'll probably be seeing him a lot more. We're prepping for a chicken coop expansion, which is right over here. I've been extremely pleased with the Carolina coop. It's easily the best coop in the planet, on the planet in my estimation. I'm gonna give my girls some treats. These are like these grublies, black soldier fly larva. Kind of weird until you get the hang of it, but they absolutely freak out. There you go. So they'll be occupied for a while. But what you can see here is sort of a menagerie of nonsense. And this was my way to let them out of the coop, get a little sun, get a little natural forage in. Chickens are omnivores. They really want to be digging and scratching through the dirt, but I don't trust letting them roam freely because there's a lot of birds of prey. There are coyotes, skunks, possums, etc. So that's what Paul's working on right now. What we're gonna be doing is extending this coop and having an outdoor run that comes out to about here comes over to the shed rainwater capture tank and actually wraps around the back so they have this sort of U-shaped outdoor run powered by the automatic chicken guard door. So every morning, it's triggered by sunrise, it'll come up. Every evening, triggered by sunset, it'll go down and they'll be able to manage themselves and kind of come around. It probably doubles or more the effective space that the chickens have to roam and forage and they've been digging it up and they've been loving it for the little time that they've been out. The last thing, is the compost bin. So this is something that we built at the later half of the fall. And I have to say, I don't even know how I waited this long to build a compost bin because as you can see, I already have two and a half bins full and have been using the rest for soil and material storage. So it's been a killer, killer project. We have a full video on that. That's the winter garden, my friends. If you wanna grab some high quality gardening products, you can always feel free to shop at shop.epicgardening.com. We stock the best stuff in the business and stay tuned because I have one of the biggest announcements in Epic Gardening history coming in January. With that, good luck in the garden and keep on growing.